I did a couple of videos recently where I talked about going home to the place where I grew up after an absence of 20 years. It was incredible seeing places and people that I hadn't seen since I was an adolescent or even a child. It got me thinking about the concept of family. I remember on one occasion I was talking to a childhood friend and I suddenly realized he wasn't a friend, he was my aunt's son, my cousin. I kind of reclassified him in my head. I realized that I'd grown up around him, and really, my son and his son would grow up around each other. It was a sense of family, I guess. I like to think that a central theme of these videos is don't take fill-in-the-blank for granted. So as I'm going through life, I often try to notice whenever I'm taking things for granted. So first, I can stop doing it, but more importantly, so I can make a note of it and I can talk about it. I'm not sure if this is something that people take for granted, this sense of family, because it's something that I haven't had in a long time. I was absent, like I said, I was locked up for almost 17 years, and then for the three years since I've paroled, I've frankly hidden. I've seen almost nobody and I've done very little. Part of it was because of parole, and I, I didn't want to take any risks, but frankly, part of it was my PTSD also. Since I've been putting myself out there, though, I'm realizing that it's not fair to say that I didn't have family while I was locked up. That's a disservice to some of the people that I knew, the, the family I had. I remember one Thanksgiving, Scooby and I, we did it right. We had just the best meal. I wasn't there with Scooby for too many Thanksgivings, so it had to be, I guess, 2003, maybe 2004. He worked in the kitchen, and for him, the kitchen had always been a, a hustle. It was where he would get his sugar, his fruit juice, his apple mash. Those were the things he needed out of the kitchen. But we'd had a talk about how I'd been a Boy Scout, and I was the camp cook, and I loved to cook. And, you know, those things they had in the kitchen, they could be used for other things besides making pruno. And so he added some stuff to his list of what he'd take out of the kitchen, stuff like spices or meats. And in county jail, I'd had a book. I, I can't even remember who brought it in, but somebody brought in an actual coffee table book describing various ethnic cuisines that they considered to be lesser known and their opinion as to their palate and what spices they used, a description of them. This Thanksgiving, I decided that I was going to do Ethiopian food. See, Scooby always had money, unless his family was cutting him off to try and get him to quit drugs, which was always a disaster. I liked to cook, and we invited a couple of other people. We said I'd make the entrees, and if anybody needed a couple of bucks, Scooby would pay for it. We had a couple of Folgers jars of Pruno on ice over in the corner, and, you know, it was Thanksgiving, so there was a game on. I was going to do the entrees, and I decided that I'd do Ethiopian food as imagined by a convict who had never stepped foot inside of an Ethiopian restaurant. It could have been a disaster, but it was just truly awesome. It was a great meal. You see, a primary staple of Ethiopian cuisine is apparently a thick, doughy bread called injera. And I thought that if I used mashed up Fritos and some top ramen soups as a base and did a little bit of work with it, I could improvise a pretty neat version of it, and it came out great. That, combined with the, the thick, paste that they use for uh, meaty stews or vegetables. It made it so that everybody could come and just take a couple of spoons of whatever they wanted and put it on one of these dough bowls that I'd made. And it was a great meal. Uh, Stu, his celly was making apple pies at the time. And he brought a mini apple pie for everybody. And, mmm. Of course, the point of this wasn't the food. Maybe I'm getting a little bit of a tangent. It's just that I remember that meal, and I'm kind of proud of it. I may actually make it again sometime in the future just to prove I still can, because I put so much work into that. But the point isn't the food. The point is that everybody brought the best things they could and shared it with each other because we really cared about each other. We, we loved each other. 
And I, I don't mean we necessarily uh, whispered sweet nothings in each other's ear, though prison is a don't ask, don't tell environment. There are plenty of people in there that legitimately have romantic relationships and love each other. I'm describing a family, though, where we were around each other every day. Whenever somebody got bad news, we were all unhappy. When they got good news, we were happy. When somebody paroled, people would stand at the door and clap. And then I think about how I always say, don't join gangs. Be careful with gangs because it's a road that ends in death and destruction, and it does. But this is what we were. The, me, Scooby, the couple of other guys, Stu, the shot caller for the building, we were the Peckerwoods. And calling a Peckerwood a, a gang is kind of like calling a bell pepper a spicy pepper. It, it is true, but it's just the most vanilla version of the thing possible. Still, though, if the six or eight of us had been hanging out on the streets instead of in prison, I don't doubt for a moment that somebody would have been actively engaged in criminal behavior, if not necessarily, say, at the barbecue we were having, certainly before or after. It, it's a gang of criminals. That's at its heart what it is. And it's the reason that I've been so cautious to re-engage with some of the people that I met while in prison, who I still think of so fondly. They're friends, and in some cases, family. But people can be more than one thing. This is what I said about Scooby in a previous video, is he was a good man, and he was a good friend. He was also a drug addict, and a serious one, which meant he couldn't necessarily be trusted. I remember one occasion where I took the time to tell him that I loved him like a brother, that he was a member of my family. And it was sad because I told him this right before I told him that I couldn't give him any more money and that he was going to have to try and figure out his problems himself. But I don't regret taking the time to tell him this as hard as it was, and even though it was a preamble to a pretty harsh no, because... I could have lost him. He could have died that next day. As it turned out, in this specific case, his life was perhaps in danger, so he legitimately could have died the next day. But as we go through our lives, so rarely do we regret telling somebody that we love them, that they're important to us. And given how long you will regret not telling somebody that, if you lose them, God forbid, take the time. If there's somebody in your life who is a member of your family and you haven't told them, well, do it today because we never know what tomorrow will bring.